Hi, this is Tabletop Templar, and today we're doing the grand campaign for the board game War and Peace. Now, I, I did a previous video on the introductory scenario, and I wanted to come back to the grand campaign because it's really something that uh, it's really unique to this game that it covers almost the entire period of the Napoleonic Wars. This particular grand campaign covers. Uh, 1805 to 1815 and it's well it's quite a bit uh, length it's lengthy and it completely dwarfs every other scenario in this game and it's really uh, one of the main reasons for the reprint and I wanted to talk about it and I decided to go ahead and set up uh, the campaign for 1805 the Grand Campaign, uh, and I just wanted to talk about some of the strategies, some of the things that um, uh, I've noticed be before uh, I embark on this. I'm playing this solo, and uh, if if this is uh, something that people want to see, I could continue and record each uh, turn. But I'm going to go ahead and kind of show maybe new players some of the um, things that you want to think about some of the strategies and uh, and really show some of the differences between the two previous versions. Now in the original War and Peace game the Grand Campaign was a bit um, un unpolished, maybe unfinished. Um, so this, I mean plenty of people made it work and there are other editions, there's 2nd edition, 3rd edition, 4th edition um, that were made to fix it up, but it still needed work. And this is supposed to be really the definitive version of this grand campaign. A few of the issues that were in the original remain, but it is definitely a little more polished. Now, one of the main um, differences is that while the original War and Peace could have could easily have been played solo and many did it wasn't really necessarily designed to be solo uh it kind of still had the old board game mentality that there's going to be a person controlling you know france there's going to be a person controlling england austria prussia or russia and maybe even spain or, or some combination and so it, it really was a, a bit tricky to get it to work but with this new edition, the designer, uh, John Gant, he devised a system where um, basically with the idea that it's going to be played either solo or with two people. And he really he even mentions this, that it, it really was designed with that in mind, that the idea of that you're going to get six people to sit down and play this is probably not the most likely and, and I think most players were playing it solo or maybe one on one. Um I, I feel like that that's a that's a realistic expectation and I, I certainly as a solo gamer, mostly a solo gamer now, I, I definitely appreciate that. So that was one of the, the big reasons why I I um, decided to get this game this version of it, because uh, the emphasis on solo play, uh, it really appealed to me, and I think that it was a good good call, because playing this the campaign is probably not realistic to sit down. If you're not gonna and play in the evening, you're not gonna complete it in that amount of time. You're gonna have to set it up, have a dedicated space, uh, and you know you're gonna have to play it over. A period of time it's not something you can do in an evening unless you're I, I don't I don't it's, it's not possible really you're gonna have to leave it set up uh, but this that's what the scenarios are for scenarios are for something that you can play in the evening but the grand campaign is really never designed to be something you play on a board game night that's something that you really you set out to tackle and uh, with that I, I think that it was a good idea to um, design tweak the rules to make it so solo and, and two-player play was really the focus. So definitely uh, agree with that. Some of the new changes to the game 
uh, for the campaign rules were the optional rules. Uh, and some of them were rules that um, were in the general magazines. And some of them were things that either gamers or John Gant had come up with and were added on uh, and compiled and added on to these rules. So um, just to take you through some of them, you know, there's commerce rating, of course. You can use the global na naval movement. Um, I, For me, for this playthrough, I'm going to try to play it based on the original rules. So I'm going to elect not to play these optional rules, but certainly you could. Uh, I would advise for your first game, for your first campaign game, to uh, not to play them. At least your first one. And there's attack action against bases, naval, hidden mode. Of course, that's pointless with uh, um, solo play. But it could be interesting. I think that would uh, definitely uh, help uh, add some flavor to the naval combat. Weather rules. I contemplated using these, but I think for the first playthrough of this campaign, I'm just, I'm just going to use no optional rules. Um, Taurus Vedras. I'm I'm just, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and not use it. Um, but certainly that's probably one of the few that you could use. But I'm just gonna be consistent. And of course you have Nelson's daring. Um, I'm just gonna keep it simple here. So uh, I'm gonna elect not to use any of the optional rules. But that's just my choice for the first playthrough. Certainly, um, if that's what you want to do, then go ahead. Another addition is the optional initial deployment setup for a historical, historic naval setup. And, um, this is basically a, a tweak version of the, um, the naval setup. So basically, it's a, it changes the, um, the deployment for... Um, France, England, and Spain. So what it's essentially doing is it's at, um, removing um, fleets uh, from Toulon because in the original one you've got ships at Toulon and it moves them to Cadiz. Basically it's piling up Spanish and French ships at the beginning at Cadiz. Uh, it moves Nelson to London and one ship and instead of the blockade at Cadiz, it moves it to, uh, it actually adds two ships um, total because it increases England, well, actually it increases by one, but it adds to the Atlantic and then the Mediterranean, it removes those. So basically it's taking Nel the Nelson uh, fleet and the Cadiz fleet, moving them to London and the Atlantic. So what it's trying to do, although... It's this is the the original setup, so what it's trying to to um, so here's Cadiz here. It's trying to start uh, essentially create the situation to refight. Uh, here's Cape Trafalgar to basically create the conditions for the Battle of Trafalgar. It's going to put a bunch of French and Spanish ships here uh, in Cadiz. And uh, and then it's going to put English ships in the Atlantic and London. So essentially, what it what they're leading the English uh, um, player to do is to link up Nelson from London, and then move with the ships to, to the Atlantic, and then come and attack Trafalgar, just like what happened. Um, of course, you're not obligated to do that, but that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to create that situation. Um, would you do it? Would you attack? Um, it'd be very risky. Uh, certainly the French and Spanish would probably not want to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elect for this um, first playthrough to uh, retain the original naval deployment and and hold off on that. Um, it definitely in the future, I, I, I will try it out. But for this one, I will uh, stick with the uh, the original uh, naval deployment. So 
Just something to keep in mind. Here's the force pool display for all the nations. And I uh, just wanted to show, you know, you wanted to just make sure to prepare this. Um, it'll say what it starts off with. So you're looking at 1805. That's when the year it starts. So you want to get 12 infantry, 7 cavalry, and put it in the force pool. Um, for those who, who are just learning this game, the force pool represents what troops are available to purchase. And so each turn you'll roll a production roll, which it, it's explained in the rules. And then you get um, those production points, then purchase uh, troops that are available in the force pool. When a unit is killed, uh, it goes into the force pool. You don't put it back in the bag. You put it back in here. And when the, if there's nothing available here, then you can't purchase it. So it's it's really a, a nice system, um, simple, but it works to show you know population uh, and economy of each nation to kind of limit what's available. So that way you don't get a country that, uh, for whatever reason, they might get a bunch of uh, you know production points and maybe they capture some cities and they're. They're, you know, or England is giving them uh, money that they can just purchase whatever. So it's, um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. And, and then even the minor nations that haven't been created yet, some of these nations haven't been formed. Dalmatia, Naples, I put these here. Um, these are potential French satellite states. They, but they're currently unformed. So I decided just to put their force pool here uh, for Naples. As you can see, four infantry, four I for infantry, and then two infantry for Dalmatia. But these nations, uh, these satellite states, currently don't exist. Uh, in order to create them, uh, the, their conditions have to be met. Bit, but it basically it means that they have to be, for this case, it has to be occupied by the French players' troops in their uh, their cities. So, but read the uh, conditions um, and to see um, what conditions need to be met in order to create um, the minor minor state, because they're they're not necessarily going to be the same conditions. So just keep in mind, uh, and then some states are already been created, and there's. And they're going to be different, you know, Bavaria. Bavaria is already created. They're a French satellite. And um, there are their pieces are already on the board. But as you can see, it's currently 1805. But from 1807 to 1810, they're going to add an infantry. So what that means is they're going to take an infantry from your bag and then place it here that's going to be available to be purchased. So it's showing that their uh, troops, more troops, you know, conscription um, is more available. So that way they can add, increase the size of their army potentially. So if Westphalia is another one. Um, and the Confederation of the Rhine has already been created. And I put the Polish troops here. Um... And then you have uh, Marshal Poniatowski and uh, the Polish uh, forces. I can move this aside. There you can see Poniatowski, three infantry and three cavalry. And then they add one infantry from 1807 to 1814 each year. And you, if in it, and you also you can see the Grand Duchy of Warsaw is formed, or the Kingdom of Poland is formed. So. Um, there's basically there's three options what you can do if you're the French player when creating Poland, or what to do with Poland. Essentially, it's called it's the Polish question. Uh, it's in the rules. You can you can read, but uh, it's an interesting um. Th you know to decide what to do. I I don't really know what the correct answer would be. Historically, 
uh, Napoleon chose, I guess, the middle option. So you have the one option is no Poland. Um, you have the middle option is the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, which is what Napoleon did. And then you have the most, uh, uh, I guess, sympathetic to Poland option. It would be the create the Kingdom of Poland, which would be, you know, uh, I guess, a, a sovereign state as opposed to um, uh, under direct French rule. But um, it does have effects on what it does to Russia. So you're going to want to make sure to read that. Um, depending on which option is chosen, Russia will come back into the um, war or could come back into the coalition sooner or later, depending on which option you choose. So if you're the French player, uh, choose wisely. Uh, maybe, you know, give it a little bit of thought. And um, But yeah, and then let me know what which option you think, uh, put it in the comments, what option you think you would be the best choice for the French. Okay, so now we're going to look at the situation in Europe at this time. So 1805, it's a year after Napoleon has crowned himself emperor. And you basically have the beginning of the third coalition. So essentially, this is a, um, a upgraded, if you will, uh, version of the Austerlitz scenario. So the French, Austrians, Russians, uh, are going to, and Prussians, are going to be essentially in the same position uh, as they are in that scenario because that's basically what what the campaign starts in so if it seems familiar if you think hey this is this is basically austerlitz but with more stuff you're correct that's what it is so um so if you played that scenario you'll definitely be at an advantage and i actually would recommend anyone who's first starting to play play the introductory scenario uh, maybe even play the second scenario because it does give you uh, um, some a taste on the naval combat. And then play the Austerlitz scenario. I would play those three scenarios first before attempting to tackle the Grand Campaign. Because it will give you really all the tools and experience you need to play the game. Now can you play the Grand Campaign right out of the box with absolutely no prior experience? Sure. Uh you know, will will it be you know necessarily a, a great experience, especially if you're if you're really new to the game? It might might be a little bit of a struggle. Um, so I, I recommend playing those three scenarios, learning the game. That way, you know how navy works. That way, you know how the rules work. That way, and then finally for the Austerlitz scenario, it's a very quick scenario. It doesn't take very long. And in the original game, the Austerlitz scenario was the introductory scenario. So it's not really complicated anyway. But it really gives you an idea of the, the strategy for the French. And the problem is, is if you really make, a, make some blunders for the French, you can really set France back quite a bit. Um, because right now the momentum is with the French. And if they do this correctly and they can take out Austria then they can really, you know, set the tempo for their game. If they if they suffer minor setbacks, if they get bogged down in, uh, take heavy losses and make some mistakes, and they end up fighting a, a huge battle with the Russians and Russians, and they lose, Napoleon suffer, you know, the, the Grand Armée gets decimated, you know, at, at Austerlitz or a, or a similar battlefield, they could really set France back quite a bit because you, then you got the British to tend with and then you've got Spain. Now Spain starts off, um, I'll pan over to Spain in a second, but Spain starts off as an ally of France. So that is, that is a big change, you know, that's a big addition for the Austerlitz scenario. Um... And so you're going to want to, uh, as the French player, you get to deploy some of these uh, Spanish troops. And you're going to want to, to attack Portugal. The British are going to be here. They've got Portuguese troops here. You've got a Portuguese fleet here. You've got ships that are blockaded around Spain 
and you've got ships that are blockaded in northern France. So you're going to want to come up with a, a strategy for how to free up some of these Spanish ships because Spain, while starting as a French ally, they will not remain a French ally. And in fact, at some, in order for the French to win, they have to invade Spain at some point. And I'll show you, if you get the, this, get this out, this is the, the, the cheat sheet with the attrition table and all that. Open it up in the middle. And you're going to see the, chrono, the uh, chronology of events. So you see, 18, January 1809, France must have invaded Spain before this date. If you don't do it, you can't win. You basically lose. So you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to attack Spain. So they're not going to be a permanent uh, ally for long. You'll get them for a little bit, but after a couple years, depending on how things go, um, they will flip. They could go neutral or they could completely flip. But either way, you're gonna have to attack them, and they're gonna have to go. They're gonna flip anyway. Or else you'll lose. And it's the same for the um, for Russia. So there's a January 10th, 1810, easier French invasion of Russia. Rule ends. And then by January 1813, France must have invaded Russia before this date. Uh, so you have to... You, so you have to... Um, so history will still have to happen. You're going to have the Peninsular War. You're going to have the Russian invasion. Now France can can accelerate it, can decide how quickly, um, but you're, you're going to have to do that at some point. So you just keep that in mind. Just because Spain is going to start off as a French ally, uh, it won't be forever. So, But you definitely you don't mind. When you start off as, as their ally, France, the French player will control their forces. And so um, you're not necessarily going to be too worried about uh, the losses, although if they do take a lot of losses, it will accelerate the Spanish uh, neutrality. So keep that in mind as well. But I think the opening move for uh, the... The Spanish forces under French control, essentially, is to attack Portugal. That's what you want to do. Kick off the Peninsular War, invade Portugal, uh, and then force the British to respond. And then you're going to also want to get these ships out of blockade. Run the blockade, um, attack, engage, keep the Royal Navy tied down. Uh, figure out what to do here. This is a looming battle. You could fight in the Mediterranean. Um, you're probably not going to... Of course, I'm playing the the rules with um, without the optional setup. So if you did play the optional setup, you're going to have a stack of ships here at Trafalgar. And you potentially could have that battle right off the, off the gate. But not doing that for this. So the fleets are going to be more spread out. And so uh, it'll create some decisions to make. This is the Southern European Front, essentially, uh, for 1805. And as you can see, there is a force here in uh, Florence. And it's a, a leader, a zero leader. And here is Naples. Now, as you can see, this is definitely a, a different map than the original game. And so you're gonna if you want to create the kingdom of Naples, you're gonna to want to take these cities. Obviously, Naples is one. And if you do, you can create that city, uh, that state. And that's something that you, this army you're really gonna to want to do. Take over the Naples. You've got Dalmatia up here. Uh, you've got army of Messena, and then and then John. You know, as you sweep forward. You're gonna to want to be want to think about creating the uh, the state of Dalmatia. So that's something to think about. This is this is gonna be an obvious uh, move to create Naples. 
And so uh, that's going to be a, kind of a no-brainer move. And that's something you're going to want to do if you're the French player. So just like the Austerlitz scenario, Napoleon is going to start off with the Grand Armée, or the bulk of it, in Strasbourg. Ferdinand and uh, this Austrian force is going to be, essentially they're going to be at Ulm. Mach, yeah, Mach and Ferdinand are going to be at Ulm. Now, I didn't place them at directly at Ulm, but this force is going to uh, is going to be there to they're, they're going to try to retreat. <laughs> essentially, um, it would be full. Historically, what happened is the Austrians were at Ulm, and Napoleon isolated, and they were forced to surrender uh, a huge force. And it was really a, uh, a disaster for the coalition forces. So they're not going to make the same mistake. And that's the thing about this game is that you know history and you know what not to do. And, uh, and you're not going to have that same you know arrogance and uh, overconfidence that the coalition forces did uh, in the third coalition. For the Austerlitz campaign. No, they're going to do the sensible thing. They're going to run, retreat down the Danube, uh, meet up uh, at Vienna, wait for the Russians, hold out, don't engage. If you engage and you're going to give, um, so in the rules, if the French, if any player defeats uh, an enemy army in, that has five or more strength points, you get a victory point, and that victory point will be used towards alliance rolls. So it's like you, you know, you're you're winning more battles, you're gaining more support, you're looking stronger to try to sway the neutral nations, uh, either from joining your enemy, or you know, or to join you, or just to stay out of the war. So by for the Austrians avoiding battle at all is the sensible thing. They need to run, and they need to regroup uh, at Vienna. Even though they're going to concede a lot of ground, they can pick some fights. They don't have to surrender everything, but they have to be sensible, avoid Napoleon, avoid this, this doom stack here, and then wait for the Russians to arrive. Because as you can see, I'll pan over, the Russians are coming. And with a combined force, they should be enough. But because the force at Ulm was destroyed historically, they didn't have nearly as many troops to, uh, to fight Napoleon at Austerlitz. They still outnumbered the French, but if, they, if uh, Mach and Ferdinand hadn't uh, surrendered and got cut off, they would have had an even bigger force to fight Napoleon and probably would have went the other way. But, obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to talk about are some of the other forces to the north. As you can see, you've got uh, Denmark. You've got some ships. Quite a big fleet over here for the Danes. You've got some troops in Copenhagen. Uh, there are some other Danish forces over here uh, in Hanover. Um, and they're going to be... They start off neutral, Denmark... But as you can see, they're blue. They are um, potentially a French ally. So they're going to be a force that the French are going to want to sway to their side. Uh, especially the Navy. I mean, there, there's three ships. There are three um, fleets in a transport. So that's a big, that's a good sized force, and they're going to be a force that would 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 really help um, tie down the the British. Maybe they can do some commerce raiding. Um, if you're going to do commerce raiding, I'm not going to do that for this scenario. I'm just going to play it how the original game was. But they're a huge asset, and so while the Den Danes don't have a huge land force. Their navy is pretty sizable, and they would definitely help. Um, they could finish off the Russians, keep them 
from doing anything. Um, although they're not really playing much of a role, they're just kind of there. Um, but definitely they could go over and, and uh, cause the, the British some trouble. Historically, the British would pre uh, they preemptively attacked the Danish fleets to avoid them from, uh, to prevent them from uh, joining uh, the war. They, they did that quite a few times to the to the Danes. So um, basically, uh, the French want to try to sway them to their side. And you've also got the um, Swedes up here. You have Sweden and You've got, this is a um, St. Petersburg up there, and to the right, and the the Russians are going to be um, potentially going into war with Sweden, and so um, Sweden is a force that can kind of be swayed different sides. Historically, Sweden was neutral, um, at least to France, they kind of... Um, were on both sides. Uh, there was the Finnish War, and um, but then they also accepted help from the British. In fact, uh, General uh, Moore had landed uh, in Sw Sw Sweden, basically offered to help to fight the Russians, but uh, the King of Sweden essentially didn't uh, accept their help. It didn't uh, said they didn't need their help, and then they eventually set sail, they loaded back up after sitting and doing nothing, uh, and they ended up going to the Peninsular War. So it was kind of a, a bit of a historical what if, what if the Swedish king had accepted their help and sent them into battle. Uh, General Moore and all those British troops could have been tied down in Finland and Sweden. Instead, they went to fight in Spain, and then, of course, they, they escaped uh, encirclement and were evacuated f there, but they slowed down the French um, invasion. So, it's kind of a bit of a what-if, but uh, I, I doubt, I highly doubt the British will actually intervene, but that'd be interesting. Um, not going to, probably won't do that. This will be essentially a sideshow up here, but um, but I both navies, both the Swedish and uh, Russian navies, both have one sh uh, fleet or ship and one transport apiece. So pretty even match. Not really. Uh, it's basically a stalemate. Um, but it's nice that they're at least represented. So uh, as far as strategy. Um, for the Russians, you know, the, the focus is going to be on Napoleon. Sweden is just going to happen at some point, and uh, you can kind of deal with them how you want. But historically, Sweden eventually joined the coalition. Um, of course, uh, Marshal Bernadotte later became uh, a crown prince of Sweden, and later, later a king. Um, but crown prince during the Napoleonic Wars, and he... Uh, he basically betrayed Napoleon, and Sweden became, uh, participated in the Battle of uh, Leipzig and um, in the Sixth Coalition, and helped uh, with the downfall of Napoleon. So, be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I remember in the original game, Sweden wasn't really a big deal, but uh, I like that more land was shown, so potentially some tactical uh possibilities but uh but I, I i doubt that we'll really do anything there just like the austerlitz stereo prussia uh starts off neutral and won't enter the war until certain conditions are met uh, mainly being the alliance roles so they will start off making alliance rules. And this is going to be kind of the biggest, uh, you know, what if. Uh, the biggest um, deciding factor is how quickly will the Prussians join the coalition. If the French can delay their entry for as long as possible, that's going to be good for them. Because they already started at war with Austria. Russia 
and England. And um oh and, and well Portugal. But um Prussia can potentially be delayed their entry. Now at some point they're gonna to want to deal with them. But if you can focus on the Austrians and Russians and you don't want to make any mistakes by and you just want to be careful that some of these territories are going to be um, satellites of Prussia and you don't want to violate their sovereignty by walking through and then you have Prussia join. So even if uh, even if Napoleon is really successful and you're, you're just crushing them, the longer the Prussians are out, the better because there are, there's always going to be things to do. You know, even if you, you're going to just take out Austria, you're going to move on to Russia, potentially chase them. Um, if the Prussians are still not in it, you know, you, you could you could really have a, um, you know, a situation where um, that you can really take your time. And that would be the best scenario, as you take your time. What you don't want is you don't want the Prussians to come in at the worst possible time. You don't want to get bogged down. You want to move quickly. Uh, time is going to be the enemy of the French. And so you want to always think about it like that. Time is always going to be against the French player. Whether it's, you know, other allies join, timing of what you have to invade Spain by this day. You have to invade Russia by this day. Um, you're, you're always going to never have enough time. And so you want to manage that time as best as you can to give you the best outcome. And you try to fight the fewest enemies at once. And if you can do that, you can give yourself a fighting chance in this game. What you don't want is you don't want to get dogpiled by everyone. Because just like the alliance rolls, and it's a very simple system, but if you start losing battles... The enemy will gain victory points. They will bring more allies to their side. You will lose allies. You know, you might get Denmark, but then you might lose them. You might lose, you know, you're going to lose Spain at some point. You have to invade. Um, you're just going to get ganged up on, and you don't want that to happen. So you want to try and, and move as quickly as you can and always Keep in mind, time is never going to be on the French player's side. So keep that in mind, and uh, hopefully that will uh, give you an idea of how um, how France should proceed. And you just don't, don't be in a hurry to bring Prussia in. I also forgot to mention, in the errata, they... Add, there is some additions to the, um, oh, where is it? Yeah, it's up here. So it adds Egypt and Malta are satellite special, sp sorry, special satellite states. And they can never become pro-French and have no production. So Egypt and Malta are added. So that is another um, thing you want to, make sure you want to print off the errata, the newest errata. Go on board game geek, get it. This is what I have, the 3.0 September 1st. I I don't think there's this um, an updated one since then, but uh, double check. Go to board game geek. Make sure you got the updated errata. You're gonna want it anyway, but it does give you that extra rule. I'm just put these these fleets here, and these to tokens here because I'm not using this. But um, the other addition is that. If it's an optional rule, but you can place troops in Cairo uh, as um, Egyptian or, or British forces that are there that can be then picked up and taken to whatever front they would need to go to. I'm opting not to play with that, as are the other optional rules, but just wanted you to be aware of um, the other rules that are... Uh, that. If you see someone playing with that, that's what it is. So just be aware of that. 
So some final thoughts before I end it about playing the grand campaign for the updated edition. So if you're uh, playing this for the first time, uh, just make sure to go through the rule book and um, kind of make sure to read about how states are conquered, um, creation of um, minor states, just so you're aware of how they work. And so that way you don't miss anything. Um, and then just make sure that you know how the naval combat works. Um, you know, with the pursuits and everything. Um, I'll do that in a separate video. So that way people can see how it's played. Um, but just try to uh, try to go through and play through it if you're doing solo. and Or, or two player. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, yeah, just try to have fun with it. You know, if there's some rules that... You don't necessarily want to play. Don't be afraid to remove them. Like for example, you know the they added the damaged rules. So for naval, um, they can do the whole damage rules. I thought these were optional in the original. Uh, I thought they. I don't remember that being the normal rule. Um, but maybe I'm just completely remembering it wrong. Um, and then the whole idea of taking prizes. I, I, I thought originally those were optional, but I guess that maybe uh, either I'm remembering them completely wrong or they were just rules that everyone had played and they, I guess it's since become uh, codified as kind of the, the normal rules. But just some things to be aware of. I, I've been reading a lot of comments and on uh, Board Game Geek and also on um, other videos about this game that a lot of players who played the original War and Peace back in the you know eighties nineties they you know they played it a lot and they kind of get you know they're used they were used to kind of slogging through a lot of the issues and they were used to playing the game in a certain way and the, I think for some the assumption is that this is basically the exact same so. Just be aware of some of the changes that might have been made. You know, some rules might have gotten a correction. Others might still be a problem and haven't really been uh, addressed. But uh, just make sure, even if you've played it a lot, just to, to really go through the rule book and, and, um, and don't assume that it's necessarily the exact same way uh, that it's been played before because... The campaign was really the, the one of the main issues for the reprint, and that's one that is oh, quite a bit of work has been done. So, especially about um, being able to play this solo in two player, because some, especially the rules and how to the victory conditions, especially, uh, are are different. So, just make sure you go through the book. And you understand, you know, what's going on and what you need to do. And just take your time, have fun, uh, enjoy, you know, enjoy the new map. And, uh, yeah, let me know in the comments uh, how your games are going. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, that's all I got for today. Happy gaming.